On this 24th week of ordinary time, we celebrate the triumph of the cross. It is a glorious feast because it highlights the central aspect of our faith. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, suffers the most extreme form of sacrifice so that we benefit from the merits of love poured out. It reminds us that at the center of reality is redeeming love. The universe is not a random arrangement of molecules that came into being from nothing, without a cause and for no purpose, and will eventually go out of existence. That life is therefore, as Shakespeare put it, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Rather, life is an adventure, a theodrama in which we participate. There are various clues foreshadowing in the Old Testament the coming cross of the New Covenant. For example, Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, climbing Mount Moriah, the very place where Christ was crucified, carrying the wood of the sacrifice with his father Abraham, prepared in obedience to offer his only begotten son. The tenth plague, or death of the firstborn, in Exodus chapter 12, where the Israelites are instructed to sacrifice a lamb without blemish and put its blood on the doorposts of their homes, so that the angel of death will pass over. The stretched out hands of Moses, by which Israel gained victory over the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. In the first reading from Numbers chapter 24, the startling prefigurement of the cross as a bronze serpent is fashioned by Moses on a pole and the Israelites healed from snake bites by simply looking at the contemptible image. Jesus takes this image unto himself as he explains to Nicodemus in today's gospel from John chapter 3. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In a sense, Christ's death on the cross is a reversal of the original sin that caused the downfall of humanity. The first Adam with his bride grasped for the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so as to achieve divine powers. Jesus, the second Adam, as St. Paul states in today's alternate first reading, precisely does not grasp at divinity, but makes himself of no reputation, humbly taking on the form of humanity, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. By so doing, the cross becomes the new tree of life, by which we are saved. How do we participate in today's feast? Sacramentally, our journey begins in baptism, where, as St. Paul states in Romans chapter 6, we are crucified and die in Christ, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might live a new life, no longer enslaved to sin. In the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we unite our sacrifices with Christ to the Father and receive Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states in paragraph 1368, quote, the Church, which is the body of Christ, participates in the offering of her head. With him, she herself is offered whole and entire. She unites herself to his intercession with the Father for all men. In the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ becomes also the sacrifice of the members of his body. The lives of the faithful, their praise, sufferings, prayer, and work are united with those of Christ and with his total offering, and so acquire a new value. Christ's sacrifice present on the altar makes it possible for all generations of Christians to be united with his offering. End of quote. The Eucharist represents or makes present the sacrifice of the cross and applies its fruits. As the Council of Trent stated, quote, Christ our Lord and God was once and for all to offer himself to God the Father by his death on the altar of the cross, to accomplish there an everlasting redemption. But because his priesthood was not to end with his death at the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, he wanted to leave to his beloved spouse the church a visible sacrifice as the nature of man demands, 
by which the bloody sacrifice which he was to accomplish once for all on the cross would be represented, its memory perpetuated until the end of the world, and its salutary power be applied to the forgiveness of sins we daily commit. End of quote. In addition to the sacraments, the cross takes prominence in our life of prayer. As children, we learn to begin each prayer with the sign of the cross, invoking the Trinity by saying, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By tracing the cross on ourselves, we learned that we belonged to God. As we matured, the truth of Christ's death taught us the price of our redemption and how we were to imitate this sacrifice daily. As St. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live. No longer I, but Christ lives in me. The downward movement from forehead to heart symbolizes the incarnational condescension of the second person of the Trinity descending from heaven to earth and from life to death for our salvation. The crossover from left shoulder to right suggests the universal action of the Most Holy Trinity in our world. The sign of the cross does not just introduce and close prayer, it is a powerful prayer itself. As St. Cyril of Jerusalem stated in his catechetical lecture number 13, quote, It is the sign of the faithful and the dread of devils, for when they see the cross, they are reminded of the crucified. They are afraid of him who bruised the head of the dragon. End of quote. As a sacramental, the sign of the cross disposes us for receiving grace and God's blessing. Making the sign of the cross also has a partial indulgence attached to it, remitting temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. On this feast of the triumph of the cross, let us thank God for all the cross represents and continues to accomplish in our lives. We thank God that although we once lived in fear of death and the grave, we now live in hope that by his crucifixion Christ has gained for us eternal life. We thank God because through the cross we are able to overcome temptation and evil even though it seems to surround us on all sides today. We are able to know peace in the depth of our heart and calm in our soul. In this day and age, this is a great gift and consolation. We thank God that because of the triumph of the cross, we know that our suffering is never empty and meaningless, but rather united with Christ participates in the redemption of the world. This again is a great gift of consolation. Finally, we praise the Lord because through the cross we have been taught how to love. This is what today's gospel points out. The famous verse from John chapter 3 verse 16 brings the cross and our entire Christian life into focus. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The key words here are, God gave. God's love is not static nor self-centered. It reaches out even to the point of sacrifice in order to draw us in. Here, God sets the pattern for true love and the basis for all our love's relationships, that is, the giving of ourselves freely and sacrificially for the sake of others. So, we thank and praise God for the triumph of the cross, for teaching us how to love, how to live in peace and security, how to suffer in and with Christ for the sake of souls, and how to die in the hope and joy of eternal life.